Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Start. So it's my pleasure to introduce Andreas Damianu, who's interning with us this winter. I mean, he's, he's a graduate student at University of Sheffield with Neil Lawrence, and he's going to talk about deep Gaussian process models. And this is, I believe, joint work with Neil as well. Yeah. All right. Thanks. OK, so uh, thanks for coming. And so this is a very recent work that we did with Neil just before I leave Sheffield to come here. Uh, but also in this presentation, I'm also going to, to include parts that are a bit um, older but very relevant to the deep GPS uh, models and for this we worked with collaborators uh, like uh, Michael Stitzias and Carver Eck. Okay, so uh, first of all uh, I want to give some motivation why you want to consider uh, GPS in deep models and well a colleague of mine said that uh, lately it's very cool to have the word deep in your title of the paper but you know apart from that I think the main motivation, um, I'm, I'm trying to display it now. So if I show to you this picture here of this girl, so in, if I tell you that this little girl here shows uh, the gesture in sign language for, um, for I love you, and then I show you this bunch of, of pictures, I, I think it's very easy for the human brain to recognize immediately that you know, the rest of the pictures uh, depict the same sign, right? So for a computer, that would be very difficult. It would be uh, very difficult even to, to, to understand that this is uh, a hand or something. So, you know, abstractly speaking, um, we know that the human brain is very good at one-shot learning and generally in learning because, um, you know, there is some sort of hierarchical representation of knowledge in our brain and also have very good prior models for, uh, for the data. And if you try to, you know, find the analogy in the computer in, uh, for the computers, then uh, we have deep belief networks that try to represent the knowledge uh, in, uh, in hierarchies. And as for good prior models, uh, it's been known that Bayesian non-parametric models are quite good and flexible models uh, and have been very successfully used as prior models for data. And of course, you can achieve uh, such an effect if you have many, many training examples as well. Uh, but that's not always possible, right? Uh, so in real world applications, sometimes we have very scarce data. So in, uh, in this talk, we are mostly interested about, um, I'm, I'm mostly going to focus on, on the two first. So the deep GPs are trying to combine the structural advantages of the deep belief networks and also the advantages that come from having uh, a Bayesian non-parametric approach to the data. And obviously, it would be nice to incorporate many training examples if possible. But uh, so there are two things. One thing is that in the current version, this is not very easy because you still use GPs that scale badly with the data. Um, and also in many, many real world applications, this is, this is not available anyway. So I'm not a deep uh, learning expert, but just a very <laughs> quick slide here. So what people are doing traditionally in um, in deep learning. So you assume that you have the, your observations y here, that's like the outputs, and you assume that these outputs come from uh, a deep hierarchy of latent units st stacked on top of each other. And the most successful approach is to stack uh, RBMs, re restricted Boltzmann machines, and, and treat all, all the above layers as latent uh, units. So the, the fact that you are using RBMs means uh, three things, basically. Uh, one is that the outputs necessarily essentially are modeled as um, a, weight, a, a linear weighted sum of the inputs. Another thing is that the units here are binary. And the inference that people usually do in these models is, to, is based on sampling methods like uh, constructive uh, divergence and so on. Uh, because you're trying to marginalize these hidden units and this is intractable. So the reason, we, uh, 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 so intuitively, if we, if we take this model and try to find an analogy but using GPs for the mappings here, instead of, RBM, uh, instead of stacking RBMs, 
then we would be able to uh, to model continuous outputs. That's one thing. We would be we would be able to have um, non-linear mappings, and we also show. I'm I'm also going to show here how we can do variational inference for this model. And this is good because you get a bound and you can do model selection and and so on. Um, of course, the good thing with traditional approaches is that they can handle huge data sets. And for the moment, this is not very easy with the GPs. But I'm going to, to describe more uh, to that in the, in the, in the um, later. So since I'm going to talk about deep GPs, I'm just a very, very quick introduction about the GPs. Uh, so uh, I, I assume most of you are even uh, experts in the GPs, but just a very quick introduction. So a GP. Uh, can be thought as an infinite dimensional um, Gaussian distribution. So here, for example, if I sample from uh, one dimensional Gaussian, it gets one of these samples. Here I get two dimensional samples. So if you sample from a GP, every sample is, is, is basically an infinite object. It's a, fu it's a function. Uh, so a GP, in order to define a GP on some function, a GP prior, uh, the basic ingredient is a mean function, which we usually take to be 0 and a covariance function. So this covariance function is evaluated on finite set of inputs. But as I'm going to show, um, the posterior then uh, is on the, over the function space. So everything is, is infinite there. And by using specific covariance functions, what you are doing is that you are making assumptions about the properties of the functions that you are trying to model and not the specific parametric form. So for example, here you, you say that you know, the functions are, are very smooth, here are not that smooth, and so on. Um, so that's what I, I, I talked about uh, in the previous slide. So you, you have a prior on, on a function, and you evaluate it on a finite set of inputs. But then if you combine it with uh, the Gaussian likelihood, then you get a GP posterior, which is over the function space, and also the predicted distribution. And this means that you can, s you can evaluate it for any input. And this is um, uh, the notation I'm going to, to use for uh, the entire talk. Uh, so y is the outputs, x is uh, the inputs, and f is the, the, the mapping between the two spaces. And uh, f it has a GP prior, Gaussian process prior. And a very quick demonstration. I guess these are, are all very clear to you guys, right? Uh, so initially, before you see any, any points and you just have the, the Gaussian process prior, uh, the model says, I haven't seen any points, so the function can be anywhere in the gray area. But then when you see, let's say, two points, the model says, well, I know that in, in the neighborhood around this point, has to be, the, the function has to pass from here, and the function has to pass from here. And because of the smoothness assumptions, you know that uh, the, neighbor, the, the points in the neighborhood cannot be you know, very far away. And you know, as you observe points, you learn the function better and better. If you, have, if you don't have a lot of points, you can still, uh, based on your assumptions, generalize as, 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 as better as, as you can, and so on. So you know, that was a very short demo for GP regression. But people ha uh, have also used GPs for unsupervised learning. And so what happens if you only have outputs, but you want to nevertheless assume a generative model based on GPs? So in that case, x, the inputs, are latent, are unobserved. And one approach is to, to say, well, since they are unobserved, um, so basically this is a GPLVM framework, Gaussian process latent variable model of Neil Lawrence. Uh, it's a very successful model. And so the original, in the original approach, you, uh, you say, well, x is unobserved, so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to optimize over it in a map way. And in the Bayesian GPLVM, which is much more recent, um, you are trying to learn the posterior distribution over x. So you are computing here the marginal likelihood. Uh, so this is intractable, basically, uh, because x, so f here, the mapping is marginalized out, but uh, but you know, if you include it here and try to propagate the, the prior, that's infeasible. I'm, just go I'm not going to expand on that. I'm just saying that this is uh, not an easy thing to do. And, but in this paper here, Titius and Lawrence, uh, they show a variational framework with some tricks that make this possible. And basically, that's where we also base uh, the approach that I'm going to, s to show about deep GPs. 
OK, so here's the, um, I'm coming to the deep GPS topic now. So that's wh what I was showing before, right? So you have your outputs and, and the inputs that can be latent. So what happens if you just stack another GP on top of that? Um, so you know, if, if you just do that and you don't want to do any inference, you just want to sample, that's easy. I mean, you can, you can do it. You just take, you know, you just take the inputs and you generate outputs based on some GP and then you use these outputs as inputs for uh, the next GP and you, you take the final output. So that's easy to do. And it will look something like this. Uh, so you take your inputs and the output looks like this because of the kernel you use here. It's obviously nonlinear. And if then you pass it again from another GP and you take outputs in more dimensions, you get outputs like this. So obviously, you see that the overall model is something more than a GP. It's not actually the overall thing is not a GP, right? Because you, ca you, ca you can see that from the outputs here, uh, you have very long-term correlations and non-stationarities. For example, you see here, uh, you have the same effect as having the length scale of the kernel to be, you know, very small or very large according to, to the layer above. So normally, you, you, it would be very difficult to, to get samples like this from a normal GP. Uh, so that, that, that's clear, right? It's, uh, so if, 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 you, if you just give to a GP this input and this output, it's, it's, it, it go, it's going to struggle, um, right? So, so that's from sampling. But if you, pres if, if you want to use this as a model for inference, so if you just w present the outputs to the model and you want to do inference for the layers, uh, that's actually very, very hard because it's, n it's very hard to regularize and to train such a model. And I'm going to explain why. Uh, so throughout this time, you assume the kernel is given. Do you learn the kernel? No, uh, but th that's a difficult thing, right? To, yeah. to learn the kernel and to also to do the marginalization. So for demonstration, you ju can just fix the kernels and give the inputs and then just sample. That's how, I mean, that's how I do that. But the, the real model is to learn the kernels and to be able to marginalize this into your expressions. That's a difficult thing. And that's what I'm going to discuss about. So just a, a bit more uh, discussion about why this is very difficult. So that's the joint distribution of the model. And if you are doing totally unsupervised learning, uh, this is also going to be latent, right? So you would have another term here, p of x2. Uh, but let's assume that now it's a, a given us an input. Uh, so if you, if, you, if you don't attempt to marginalize this guy here and you just try to learn everything, so then basically this is, uh, this is basically the hierarchical GPLVF of Lawrence and Moore, 2007. And what they show there is that it's very difficult to regularize it because for one thing, the dimensionality of these guys, of the latent variables, has to, give, to be given a priori. You don't know how big uh, this random variable should be. And you know, this increases as you go up, uh, as you have more layers. And for this reason, it's also prone to overfitting, because all, now all these are parameters of the model. You try to optimize over them. And most importantly, they show that deep structures are not really supported by the model evidence. So, so if they, if, if they try to, to do map um, inference here, and you, you also include in your kernel white noise, as people normally do, so they find that in the top level, the white noise just explodes. It's like switching off the, the deep structure. So the model prefers shallow structures, and they have to force it. And the cool thing about the, the stack GPs in the Bayesian framework that I'm going to show is that the model actually su supports the deep hierarchy even when you have very scarce data. So that's a solution we proposed in, the, in this very recent paper. And <clears throat> And we argue that the proper thing to do is to marginalize all intermediate layers, like people are doing with uh, traditional deep belief networks. And to do that, basically, you want to, to compute this uh, marginal likelihood. So here, I only have one hidden layer, but it's the same if you have more hidden layers. Uh, and as I said, this is intractable f even, for, for, even for, the, um, for the simple stacking. So consider even stacking more layers. Uh, but uh, we show that in our framework, you can use a variational bound. 
uh, which is not standard, actually, it's a bit more involved, and I'm not going to go into the details, but I'm going to give so intuition. the nature of this mount similar or different from DBN's bar uh, contrasted divergence? So, uh, I'm not an expert, as I said, in the, uh, in the, in the, in the DBN, but uh, I think people there are based on, on sampling techniques, right? Yeah. Um, so, he here it's not sampling, it's variational inference, so you have a deterministic approximation. And you know, uh, so, so you have a lower bound on, on the actual thing you want to compute. And you just try to minimize the distance. So this is a constant because it's marginal likelihood on the, on the data. And so do you know whether this similar thing can be applied for TBN at all? So I know that people have tried to do uh, variational approaches. And I have seen, I think Ian Murray has re recent papers. Uh, but I, I don't know how successful it is, but I know that people still use the more traditional techniques. So. Uh, I don't know, but I know it's not an easy thing to do. And you know, some people might argue that maybe it's better to do sampling in the first but place. I don't know. Really lose one, so hopefully this one can provide a little bit tighter bound. That would be more useful. I don't know. So you don't have guarantees in the other case. Uh, you can just hope uh, because you know you do sampling. You don't know. He here it's a bit better because you have actually the bound. Yes, but. Um, what 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 is the difference compared to? So you do sam let, let's say you do sampling. Mm -hmm. It's closer to what you will see uh, when you apply your model, right? Uh, Unless you want to marginalize all the time. I mean, even at but but, but you're doing sampling sampling also also for the purpose of marginalizing, right? Mm -hmm. So they're, they're both approximate techniques. And you know, people in machine learning, they just, I don't think they have settled which is better for, for, mo for general models anyway. Um, Normally, what you can do, I don't know uh, what, what uh -huh. is your practice. Yeah. Usually, you, you, you can create some very, very small model, mm -hmm. just a few nodes. Mm -hmm. And for that, you can do exactly the sampling. And then you get the real you know, influence. And then from yeah. that, you can compare how close the bound is. Uh, yeah, that, that's actually true. Yeah, But we haven't implemented, yeah. Exactly. I haven't tried that, but uh, that might be a good idea, actually. And you know, we were discussing that because it's good to see both approaches. Um, but you know, sampling is you can do it any time. So sampling is applied everywhere. So, uh, but the variational method is something that you have to develop, and it's not stand And this one is not standard variational method. It's a bit more challenging, actually. And 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 it's it's not only the inference. So it's also the regularization thing. If you want to, to do these things properly, you have to find a way to regularize this uh, very large uh, network of layers and all these degeneracies after feeding from one GP to another. So that's very hard to learn. And so we, we use a few tools. So the first tool, as I said, is um, the first tool, as I said, is to find a way to marginalize all the intermediate layers, which, which is uh, unfortunately not straightforward. And to do that, we, we extend the various methodology of the Bayesian GPLVM. And actually, um, we, we based that on a paper we had in last year NIPS. Um, it was only for, for a WART model, for a two-layer two model. And we can also. I'm also going to explain that in the most generic case, uh, you can also learn additional structure by allowing the hidden units to be conditionally dependent, to, to form conditionally dependent sets uh, by using a manifold relevant determination method. I'm going to expand on that in the, in the following slides. Just methods to make this very big and difficult to, to regularize structure easier to learn and to automatically find. Um, so first, I just want to give some intuition as to why marginalizing the intermediate layers and using this Bayesian framework uh, works well for discovering the structure of the model. So you know, as, as I said before, uh, a GP basically relies on covariance function. So if you don't use n covariance function, but you use this specific automatic relevance determination covariance function, then you know, that's a normal covariance function that says if, if two inputs, uh, xi and xj, are very close, then the function outputs should be very similar for these two model, uh, for these two points. But this specific function also has uh, a weight that weights it, each dimension of the latent points individually. So 
so you can imagine x, you know, the inputs uh, to be a matrix where rows are, are points, one row is one point, and columns are dimensions. So if you fit a GP on this, and you would have one weight per column, and when you optimize, a lot of these weights go to zero uh, in the Bayesian framework. And the model is saying, you know, I don't need this dimension. So what we are doing is that. So do you, you are talking about learning the weight, right? Yeah. I thought it's very hard to learn. Uh, you just mentioned earlier. So That's some hyperparameter learning for the. It's just oh, hyperparameters. Oh, so, so these weights are not uh, are not um, are not the traditional ways that you use for the DBNs. It's more like it's, it's like weights of the covariance function. It's hyperparameters of the model. So you tie them all together, but you don't know. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So what you are doing is that um, you have this model. Le now let's say you, ha you just have this, these two guys here, right? It's not deep at all. It's not hierarchical. You have your outputs, right? And you just initialize the, um, the so you have a latent node here, a, a latent random variable. You don't know what it is. You just initialize it with, let's say, 10 dimensions, and then you do the, the learning. And after you do the learning and you plot the weights, you see that the Bayesian procedure turns off all the unnecessary weights. So here is for the oil data demonstration. The model says, you know, I just need two dimensions, so I can represent my original data in just in two dimensions. I don't need the rest. And the one dimension that's doing all the work is basically this dimension that is doing all the separation. So, so that's that's so. So this is a very powerful way of learning the structure um, of this model. And th this is just a demonstration on a shallow architecture, but you can generalize this as you add more layers. So is, is, that, uh, is that clear? Is that, um, you know, intuitively? How, how does that kernel differ from uh, this, uh, uh, what's called the radio basis function kernel? That normally so that's the same, right? so Yeah, so that's a radial basis function. So you just with, with hide a, the parameters. With, yeah, with, with, with this additional thing here. So if you take this out and you, and you make it common for all dimensions, if you, if you place it here, as a common parameter, then then this is just the, the RBF. And so the other tool I'm going to uh, that that we can use in um, f for for eventually starting the GPS uh, is a manifold relevance determination method. And there we, we we use again the same the same trick with the ARD. So again, I'm talking about about the case where you have only uh, a very uh, not a deep architecture, it's just the outputs and the inputs, and you have a GP here. So, what happens if uh, you know instead of this case, you have two output modalities? Let's say you have data from uh, from Kinect, and you have the RGB color and the depth images. If you try to model them in a generative framework with you have to assume that if, if it's generative, then the later variable has to, to have some commonality, right? It has to be common or some parts to be common, right? Because if these guys are very, very relevant to each other, then and in, if they're generated by the same random variable, there they have to be some commonalities. But if, 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 if you only use a single random variable for both, then you lose all the private information in the outputs, right? So if you, if you have RGB here and depth here, uh, and you model them with the same random variable, then you, you can, and you have a video, then you, you can successfully probably model the dynamics of the video, which is common in both views, but you lose all the private information, like the color or the depth or whatever. So that's, 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 that's like the CCA model, right? Um, so wh wh what we did and what we are going also to use for for the generic version of the deep model is that um, you can have your output modalities here and you use two different uh, GP mappings for each modality from the initial latent space. So, so you have a latent space, a, a big random variable initially, and, and you have two different Gaussian processes which come with two different weight vectors per, per modality. And when you fit the model, there you get these different uh, weight vectors. And these weight vectors define the segmentation of the latent space. And I'm going to show it here a bit more clearly. 
So here you have one view, and here you have another view. You fill the GPs, and then uh, you have one, one, weight, one weight per dimension of the initial latent uh, variable. So if, for example, this weight uh, is switched off, we know that this dimension doesn't, doesn't matter for this guy here. Uh, if, this, if the first weight here and the first weight here are, are switched on, are non-zero for both, then we know that this is in a shared space. So you can automatically learn a, a segmentation of the, of the latent space in this way. Right? How big is Q in any practical problem? So Q has to, uh, you have to initialize it and then you let the... Uh, I, I will explain, but you have to initialize it and then the Bayesian procedure takes care of that. So it's difficult to know a priori, but that here's the thing. Uh, if you have a matrix of data that's uh, n data in Q dimensions, then the rank of the matrix cannot exceed n or Q. So if you have 50 data, Q cannot be more than 50. So at most, you use 50. So many, is it the Bayesian optimal can work well? Typically, kind of hard. Uh, yeah, I mean, a very small number. You probably use so them. we have tried this with dimensionalities where the outputs are millions, okay. and and we have a uh, hundred data points. So initialize with uh, twenty dimensions, okay. and eventually many are switched off. So so the thing is that you know if you don't have a lot of data, um, the rank of the matrix cannot be cannot be much. So. So usually I use 20 in practice, just as a rule of thumb, uh, because it's, it's not what the real dimensionality of the data is. It's not what the real dimensionality of this, the intrinsic dimensionality of this is. It's what your actual, your actual data set supports, right? So maybe you so have... You this problem, Bayesian optimization works well? Yeah. For the yeah, I'm going to show you a demo right now, actually. So... Uh, so... I think it's better if I first describe the the, the data set. So, so here's the data set I'm going to use. So you ca uh, I don't know if you know the Yale faces. So it's a bunch of images uh, from different people. And for, for each individual, you have images taken from different light, light angle. So, so what we did is, is that we created um, one data set where we have all different all the all different images of one individual and all different images of another individual and three individuals in total right so here we have uh, the images of three different persons under all possible illumination conditions in the other data set we have all images of three different persons again under all illumination conditions and then we align the images so that the only thing that they have in common is the 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 angle the lighting direction so, uh, so we have three different people in total in this data set and three different people in total in this data set. And we do the matching so that, uh, for example, uh, any guy here can match any guy here as long as it's from the same light position. So artificially we created a data set where the commonality is the light direction and the prime information in each data set is the individual face characteristics of the, mo of, of the, pe the persons. And, and let's see the demo here. So, um, okay, so what I'm going to do here is that I train the model on this kind of data, and I got this, uh, these weights. So these weights tell me that, um, these weights tell me that um, when initialized with 14 dimensions, dimension 1, 2, and 3 is common for both data sets. And because the weights are switched on for both data sets, for example, dimension 4 uh, is, is only relevant for, for, the second mo for the second data set and so on. So here I plot dimensions, latent dimensions, against each other. And, uh, Every time I move, I, I move the mouse, I, I sample from, from these points just to see what happens and to see what kind of information I, I can encode. So firstly, I'm going to sample from dimensions 1 and 3, which as you see are common. And since the model learned that these two dimensions are common, I, I would expect to see light va only va light variations when I sample. So you see the outputs here. And indeed, that's the case. So 
I sample and you see that what changes is only the direction of the light, right? So wh whatever you have red crosses is the actual training inputs that map to outputs. And wh whenever I move in the white space, it's just novel outputs because it's a, it's a model of a continuous variables. So here I basically generate from novel lighting directions. If I go to the extremes, I can get also more extreme uh, stuff that are not in the original data set. So you see that successfully the model learns that uh, dimensions 1 and 3 are common for, for these data sets. So now I'm going to fix, let's say, the light direction here. And I'm going to sample from the private space to see if it encodes indeed private information. So dimensions 5 and 14, as you can see here, are private for the first model. And what happens when I sample from these dimensions is that I get outputs that only vary in the private information, which is the characteristics of, of the persons. So here, when I sample, I, I, I get outputs for the first guy. When I sample here, I get outputs for the face of the second guy, and here for the third guy. And the cool thing is that when I sample in between, I get novel outputs. So here I get like this morphing effect, which is kind of cool. Uh, you know, I want to try that with my own face as well. <laughs> so you see that there is this morphing effect. If you go in between, you get the face of a guy, which is in between this guy and this guy. And all this is by having fixed the direction of, of, of the light to be there. You know, I can just go back uh, and dimension is the one that's not zero. So, so this okay. dimension is 5 and 14. So it's 5 and 14, which are the dominant dimensions that are also private for one of the models. So eight and ten, which are the private so if I take 8 and 10, nothing is going to happen because the model just, so that's a good question. So the model is just going to ignore. It says, you know, uh, nothing happens the model just doesn't, doesn't care, you see? So now it's sample, but the output doesn't change because the model says that these dimensions are irre irrelevant. Because you're showing the model for, 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 the, first, the, model for the first. Uh... Exactly, so, 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 you are, so you are here, and so you are here, and oops. And it's like trying to produce outputs in this guy by sampling from the private space of this guy, it just doesn't go going to, to nothing, not, nothing happens. So first I sampled from the, the, the shared spaces, that's when the light direction changed, and then I sampled from the private space, and I could, do, I could also do the same for the other modality. But you get a feeling of how this works, right? Yeah. yeah so I suppose you have to show when you have one more layer up, things will get better. Well, yeah, so that's, that's a tool we can, we, can, we can use to learn some additional structure in the latent space. And, and now I'm, I will just actually yeah, start talking about stacking GPs eventually. So, but just first to mention that, you know, since we are here in Microsoft, uh, that potential applications, so motion capture data, we have actually tried on that and it works pretty well. Silhouettes and, uh, and motion capture data. But an maybe another idea would be uh, Kinect data, I actually want to try that for the, the gesture challenge. I think it would be a good idea, also for the deep model, but I never had the time to do that. Uh, but you know, it's something that I want to do in the future. Okay, so now eventually back to stacking GPs. Um, so so for the moment, that, so that's the most general uh, graphical model simplified of, of the stacked GPs. It's what I showed so far. But now, I, I'm, I just want to mention that you can also expand the model horizontally in the manifold relevance determination uh, method that I showed previously, so that you can have more modalities in the outputs. And in the same manner, as you said, you can have conditional independencies in, um, in the hidden units. But th uh, so that, that's, that was the intuition. But to make things simpler, Let's forget that you can additionally learn this kind of structure. And let's, let's just focus on the simple case where you have one output modality and then you have stacked random variables. So just forget about this. And let's just uh, focus on the case where you have your outputs and then you stack uh, la la single random variables. 
all the way up. So as I said, we need a variational methodology to be able to marginalize all hidden layers. And it's because it's a bit complicated, I'm not, I'm not going to show exactly the math, but that just as a quick demonstration, just to get a feeling of what kind of variables are involved and the complexity and how you can optimize this thing. So, so that's just, I mean, I'm not going to explain, obviously, but uh, just to get a feeling. So if you want to marginalize all these guys, all the, the latent variables, well, th this can also be observed if you have, deep, if you have supervised learning. But anyway, if you want to marginalize the latent points, then you want to compute a, a bound on, uh, on P of Y. And to compute this bound, you will have to add uh, all these terms here. And I just want to show graphically that the first term depends on this, on the leaves. And you have terms like this uh, on the intermediate layers and this term for the top layer. And so this guy has an expression like this, and this guy has an expression like this. I'm not going to describe it, but I just want, want you to see uh, how this thing scales, right? Um, so what you want to do, and if you make some more calculations, is that you introduce some additional um, variational parameters that we call u here. And you want to take uh, expectation li like this and like this for, for this term. And the, the reason I'm just showing this without explaining is just because I wanted this to say, uh, to, to, to comment about the complexity of the model, that what you have is basically one set of variational parameters per, uh, per GP, so per mapping. So, so again, if you go to the simple case, you know, uh, where you don't, you don't have all these modalities, you have this case, you would have one set of uh, variational parameters here and one set of kernel parameters, and the same for this guy, and the same as you go up. So this thing, as you can see, uh, scales pretty much uh, L times the same amount as for the sparse GPs. Um, but, you know, you have to take these expectations and these couple of things make things a bit more complicated. You have additional matrix multiplication. So in practice, it's a bit slower. And because of, of all these calculations, the problem becomes even harder. So you have a non-convex optimization to do. And, you know, you, ha you have a lot of local minima. I just want to show that, to, to comment on the practical uh, way of telling this model. So this is a very fundamental question, right? So yeah. one of the main problems of the generative model with the deep, that's how yeah. the DSR can develop, is that you get this explaining away effect. Yeah. Which is pretty hard, right? So that's mm -hmm. hard. So how, do you have any way of uh, removing this kind of effect? So, 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 so the, the, the I, think, I think the stronger regularizer is the Bayesian framework itself. So when you have a Bayesian framework and you have the prior, the model is you know, it's somehow like an automatic Occam's razor. It's not going to overfit as in the maximum posteriori approach. Um, because you have, you know, this Occam razor effect that tries to regularize things. So if you have a, ma a maximum posteriori approach and you are trying, let's say, to do the same thing here, you would get all weights switched on because the model says, oh, more dimensions, okay, I can use them, no problem to fit the model better. But if, if you have a Bayesian model, it tends to regularize itself better. And the model will say, I don't need this, these dimensions. So if you generalize it as you add layers, uh, that, that's the, the, the vital ingredient that makes this thing possible. So you think this is because of the unique property of GP that can do this rather than the so general it's Bayesian? Not, it's not, so it's the variational framework that allows Bayesian treatment of the, whole, of the whole thing. So if you just stack the GPs here and you don't marginalize this and you try to optimize, um, then it's going to overfit. But if you marginalize this within the Bayesian framework, then it's, it's going to sort of auto-regularize. I'm not saying that this is ideal, but, um, but for example, we don't get this effect that, that, um, that, that, that they notice that if, if you don't optimize it, the top layer is like switched off because it learns a lot of noise. The model says, you know, I will just try to, to learn this with a single node here as, with as many dimensions as possible, and that's it. 
Um, so yeah. the model is more robust in doing this abstract learning and this hierarchical learning. So the variation learning in that aspect probably is more important than and the process being Gaussian yes. process rather than just Gaussian. So it's both because also the, the, the Gaussian process is a non-parametric model. So I think it's it's both into the regime. It's like uh, I think I, th I think you need these two both things for the for the recipe. And I mean, by looking what people are doing in the DBN uh, literature, they also have this sort of problems, right? So uh, they need to initialize very carefully. Uh, they do these contrastic divergence tricks, and they start from a point, and then they sample. So this point, th this problem exists here as well. Obviously, you have to initialize very carefully. Uh, but what I'm saying is that if you do all these things carefully, here, in theory, and uh, as we uh, will see in practice, you get good results. If you didn't have the Bayesian framework, then you would have a model that, you know, by definition, w w would not be. Well, I mean, I mean, be the whole point is that. All the problems you mentioned about DBN, that's all true. And you know, all these problems. And that's why in practice people never use DBN. They use DBN and they use as initial parameters so, to do something else. Right. I, I, I don't know whether that kind of so here's the thing. Uh, I don't know if uh, I don't want to claim that this is going to replace DBNs. Uh, because I haven't made actual experiments to compare the two. And this is because I know that it's very difficult to train the DBNs. And I didn't want to misrepresent them and say, oh, you know, this is better. Um, but I just want to, 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 to show, you know, from a... For, for yeah, the point is that having been better than TV is no interest in practical, for practical people. Right? <laughs> right. So I want to see that whether so you can extract I, information from this that could be a bit better. So than that, that's in the, in the next else. slides. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but, okay, so if, so uh, I, I see that... Um, you want the main, the, main to the main points, and I should re uh, mention them. So if you, I think that if you try to get the gist of what I'm trying to, to, to intuitively pass here, is that firstly, I'm, I just want to give, you know, a, a, maybe a new fresh perspective in the um, general philosophy of deep learning, and say, you know, people only are, are stuck with uh, RBMs and are doing, may maybe we should start thinking about better mappings between the layers and different models that are still deep. And another thing is maybe to, 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 to demonstrate that when data are scarce, and that's what I'm going to show in the experiments, and that I know for sure that deep models struggle when they have very, very few data points, uh, even when data are scarce, you can use this model and learn useful representations. And, and yeah, and, and as regards to the Bayesian versus non-Bayesian thing, uh, as I'm going to show, having the, the bound here and having the variation approximation, you can see that the model actually supports deep hierarchies. So what I'm going to show is that um, uh, in the experiments, I tried models of different, high, uh, different levels. So I tried the model of one, one deep, uh, uh, you know, level um, one um, layer, two layers, three, four, five. And the model and the bound actually, the model evidence prefers the deep hierarchies. And, and this doesn't happen in the, in the uh, maximum posteriori, if you take maximum posteriori. So the, the model actually supports the deep. So you know that it's a, it's a correct model to use. Uh, then, of course, you have the inference problem, and as I said, the non convexity. Um, but you know, it's a complicated model. That, so, <laughs> um, okay. So let's now start seeing these things in practice. So to see this in practice, I will just take the simple case where I have the observed outputs. And I only have uh, a two-level a two architecture. So this is not deep, but it's, it's still stacked. So uh, in the normal GP, you would have only this. So now in the stacked GP, only, level, only two levels, but still. Um, what you are doing is that you take the, the real inputs, you pass it through a GP, and then you take these latent nodes and you pass it through another GP to get the outputs. Uh, so it's what I showed in the beginning, but now I'm going to comment on, on the training that you mentioned. So now, now what I'm going to do is that I'm not going to sample, I'm just going to see real data. I'm going to see real data and real inputs, and instead of modeling them with a single GP, I'm going to, I'm going to model them with this GP. So instead of taking the inputs and the outputs and training a supervised model. I'm taking the inputs, I'm passing them through a GP that I'm going to learn. 
um, I'm, t I'm marginalizing this level, so I'm taking a distribution, and then I'm passing them through another GP. And intuitively, I would expect this to be a more robust model because it can model data like this, for example. And this is basically uh, a, this is basically a warp model, right? So you take the inputs of the GP and you warp them into something else before feeding them to the other GP. And this is basically a model we presented in uh, last year NIPS 2011. And there we, we just showed that only for um, for for the case when the inputs are t are time, but it can, it can be anything actually. So you have a model that can model sequences, right? So you, each point here has its associated time point. Um, let's see where I have the examples. So let's say you have a, um, you have a, a, a video sequence, and you have you know, you have me talking and so on. So each frame is, is a picture of me. And you give to the model the time points. So here is me at time, this time point, here is me at the next time point. And you try to model it through this instead of through a regular GP. Um, and I'm going to show you maybe another demonstration now with this model. So here, I did exactly this, um, so give me a second. So here I took a video of this woman talking, and this is very, very high dimensional, by the way. And the cool thing is that with all these models, uh, we are able to model very high dimensional um, data. So even, even if you have a uh, HD video with millions of dimensions. So here we only have 150 training points. And each point is, is nearly a million dimensions. We just fit the row pixels. And we took this video, we removed some blocks of frames, and we tried to reconstruct these blocks. And to reconstruct these blocks, we gave the time points for the missing blocks. So we said for the training data were, uh, were the, the observed frames with the time, time stamps. And the test data were uh, the timestamps for that I, I'm asking to, to generate. So it's like third minute, show me what the frame should be. Interpolation. Interpolation, exactly, right? Plus, we can give some partial observations. So here we gave, but you can also not give partial observation. Here we you just gave know half. Something missing. If you don't know there's something missing here, can you technically do so, so that's a good question. So, uh, it's a generative more. model, and you don't have to know because you can even do oversampling. So, um, if you have, if 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 you have, simple example, seconds one, two, th until ten, right? And you try to generate the video from uh, seconds one, one point five. So, I mean, what does it mean to be missing? It's a generative model. You can just generate as many samples as you want in between, right? If it, if you happen to have this sample, then it's okay. But you don't really care. Uh, you just sample as many as you want. So here, whenever you see the green bar on top is the training point, and whenever you see the, the red bar on top is something that was missing, but we generated it. And then we put everything in place just to show that the video is quite smooth. And let me play the video here. So you see that it, 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 try, it manages to generate uh, so during the red point, which part of video have been removed? So it's random blocks. It's so, uh, but 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 when you see the red points, so so for example, I mean, like if this is red, this means that th this was removed and th it was reconstructed. So, so original the entire one. frame, entire frame, or parts of the frame. So oh, for I this for this for this demo, I the uh, only from the lip from the lip from the down lip and on the bottom was presented to the model along with the timestamp, and all this was missing and it was reconstructed. But to get very similar results if everything is missing. And so it's, it's automatically smooth from previous frame. In the exactly, frame. yeah. Okay. So it's like a very, very sophisticated mean yeah. somehow. And actually here I post in the most challenging frame, <laughs> uh, and because it's where the, where the head moves, and the, the model doesn't have enough data, so it's a bit blurry. Um, so, it's like motion blur, so 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's not emotional. So it's, it's, the, it's actually the uncertainty, though. <laughs> because the model is like, oh, I'm going to take a bit of this and a bit of this. And it's okay, but a carbon filter, right? Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, time, uh, you know, it's the same thing. Some, you know, uh, probabilistic way of predicting the trajectory. Yeah. They use the trajectory side. Uh, so I, I also have another video, but. So, so this was interesting. So, so there was a case when she was blinking and it will keep oh. the blink, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, How did you notice that? Actually, I wanted to comment on that and I forgot. So, <laughs> so, uh, so the eye. So that, that, that's actually a funny thing. So, so, how does it know? so the model doesn't actually know. So you, you see funny things happen, happening in the eyes because you only give this, yeah. this, and the timestamp. So the model tries to learn this, but. Um, it's not very easy, so you, you, can, you can indeed see very funny th stuff. Not very so funny, but... Original, uh, one blinking or not? I mean, I didn't compare frame by frame, but... Um, <laughs> but but I, th I think there is a point where she's blinking and uh, she shouldn't be or something like this. But, 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 I, but in my opinion, this is actually a good thing, because it's a generative model and you don't want to get stuck to... That was only trained on 100 data. You don't want to get stuck on that. You want to generate new things. And if... Well, the, 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 I think the issue is that whether Gaussian process is smooth enough. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the blinking is not that smooth compared to other parts. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So somehow you have to know what part is... Yeah, exactly. So, so, so the GP is struggling to learn uh, the smooth parts and the non-smooth parts. So it's a bit... Um, so that, yeah, that's why it's happening. Uh, uh, so if we have time, I'm going to show another video later. But because I want to make sure that I'm going to show also the deep, the, the deepest um, experiments, I'm going to keep this for the end if we have time. So you know, if we have time, I, can, I will come back and also show another video. But first, I, I just want to make sure that I, I will present this uh, final two slides because they are actual actual deep hierarchies. Um, so so these uh, these things are actually in the paper, and. And so, so here we use the MNIST data, and we consider a deep hierarchy. So now it's not no longer just two layers. We 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 got um, we train models with two, three, four, or five layers in total. And here I'm presenting the results for the deepest hierarchy we tried, five layers. We took a very small subset of the MNIST data, uh, and we we only took uh, 50 samples of zeros. 50 samples of sixes and uh, 50 samples of ones. So we have three classes. And in total, 150 points only. We trained the model, and we got this optimized weight. So you remember that I said it's vital to have this Bayesian framework because you can learn automatically the structure of the model. So that's what you see here. Uh, the model, so you initialize these guys, let's say, into, in 20 dimensions or something. And then the model says, OK, you, you, only, give the, you only give the outputs, only, you only give the images of the digits. And the model automatically says, and, and the depth you like, and the model automatically says, OK, I'm going to use uh, 12, 12, um, latent u 12 units in the first layer, uh, 5 units in the second layer, and you know, 4 units in the top layer, and so on. So the model automatically switches off units, basically. And that's what's, make, what's making it robust. And when, I sam and when I sample from these spaces to see what they encode, I get samples like this. So uh, I, I'm going to show that you, you learn features that are going from generic features to local features as you move down to the hierarchy, as someone would expect. So if you sample from the very top layer, so the very top layer is four-dimensional. If you sample from the dominant dimension to see what's, what's going on, you get samples that uh, basically can be any digit. So you, you have a zero, you have stuff in between, uh, you have six, and then you have something that looks between six and one, and you have ones. So the top layer indeed um, encodes the most abstract information. Uh, it encodes the information that, uh, you know, I have three digits, and that's how they look like. And because it's a generative model, you can also sample stuff that are in between. 
because it's a continuous variable. So this is after all the learning is done in the very So after, exactly, okay. you do all the learning, okay. and then you try to uh, you try to sample from the model and to see, and to see and to see uh, what, what the model learned. So uh, if you sample from this, from the top layer, you get samples like this, which is very generic. So the top layer says, you know, what I'm, I'm encoding is just the, if it's 1, 6, 0, or something in between. And if you sample from this layer, it's, again, abstract, but less abstract. Let me try to understand. What do you mean by sample from one layer? What happens to the other layer? I mean, there's the whole generative process, right? Yeah, so you sample from here, and then you propagate. And I see. Okay. So, so you're not marginalizing or anything? You mar um, so you, you do marginalize, so it's, you take the posterior distribution of, of, okay. of this yeah. Yeah. given, of, you know, you, you, you take the posterior distribution by having... Okay. And then just propagate that posterior. Yes, the yes. So here, let's say that x is four-dimensional. What you are doing is that you initialize to a single x, and then you change the values of one of the dimensions continuously, and you get this output so those by... So different sampling point, huh? you get different numbers. So these are different samples. So actually, I have a demo here, but I don't know if we have time. Yeah, so we should probably wrap up. OK. Yeah. I mean, you so can show the demo at the end of the okay. So it's the same thing that I showed before. And I'm just going to show how, 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 how this was generated. And So here, uh, I'm just going to, to show how I generate samples from the bottom layer. So it's exactly the same thing, right? So I'm just sampling from, uh, from two dimensions, two of the dimensions of the bottom layer, and I obtain very local features. So you see the encode if the zero is closed or not, if it's a closed circle in this dimension, and this is something different. And if I sample from the second layer, Again, you have more local features, you see? More local features. And if I sample from the top layer, I have very generic features. You get ones, zeros, sixes, you get everything. Yeah, that's a, this is a very different way of doing this. Uh, DBN uh, generation one, because over DBN, they put the label as part of the hidden state the level. Yeah. And, they, and then they use this, uh, what's called the sampling, you know, in bi-directional. Yeah. And the ones is cover just in the, not general order. Um, so, so here you can do the same thing, right? You put that certain... Uh, so, but, but you still initialize... Um, yeah, I mean, you are right. You can just sample, but I think you can do the same in the DBNs. You do specific label ones. So, so if I said, uh, let's generate um, nine, for example, you won't be able to show me what it looks like. To, gen to generate, let's say, nines. So, you don't have the, uh, so like you, unit, you, can, you, you can do that if you figure out uh, so which dimensions are, are, are responsible for, oh. for generating nines. But if you, if you want to... But can't you do that? You have input, and then you, lab, you append the, yeah, the you labels. Yeah, you the labels. Right. Yeah. And then you learn the network, and then you say that, all right, when this bit is yeah. one. So, exactly. so, you so, have to see what that, yeah. so, so actually, you freeze that unit yeah. as part of the... Uh, part of so the, actually, when I showed these models... Yeah. So you basically look at the conditional Condition. distribution. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's what TBN yeah. is doing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. Easy to see the comparison. Actually, yeah, that'll be great, actually. So yeah, actually, actually try that for speed synthesis. It actually worked quite well. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> so actually, with this model that I showed, here you can say I have my data, and here I have my labels. We have tried that, and it works pretty well with a motion capture. Yeah. So you can, here you have your actual data, and here you have the labels. And then when you give a new label, you can, you can sample and go through the latent space and get outputs here. So that's exactly what you asked, right? And you can do the same exactly in the oh. deep. So you can just give a label here, you can go through the deep hierarchy, and then obtain Wait, samples here. Uh, no, and I, I, and I didn't think about that, actually. Uh, although you can see what kind yeah, of yeah, actually, probably, yeah. model is good, so, so, can learn what's in. So you are right. That, 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 that could be quite interesting. I mean, you can still do it if you figure out if a single dimension is responsible for generating six, like, in the other demo that you had specific face, but 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 yeah, that, that's uh, that's actually a good idea and straightforward to do. Even. And so that's the last slide. I don't know if we have time for this experiment. Um, so I think it's better if I just describe this is quicker. So what I did here um, is again with the two modalities. 
so you have two different data sets. The first data set is motion capture for, for a guy walking. The second data set is for the other guy walking. But these two subjects are interacting. So they approach each other, they do a high five, and then they go apart. So uh, you know that the, the dynamics have some commonality, right? Because they are doing very similar motions. But they also have some stuff that are not common because you know, this is different walking style, also different direction, obviously, and so on. So we model this with a deep, uh, with a deep model, with a stacked GP model. And we also use this money for relevance determination trick to, to take into account different modalities. So here we have all the frames for the first guy walking. Here are all the frames for the second guy walking. And we, that, that's all we give to the model. We train the model, and then the model automatically uh, discovers this latent space that basically says, I have a shared part, and I have two private parts, and I have uh, a shared part on top of the hierarchy in, the, in this deep model. And the shared part looks like this, which is pretty intuitive because it's like the motion of the, it's like the motion of these people that go like this, do a high five, and then they continue walking. And if you sample from here and get outputs in the first output space, you get this guy. If you sample from here and you get outputs in the second output space, you get this guy. So it's like saying, uh, this is indeed shared information because it's at the point where they are, they are about to high five. If you sample from this point, it's uh, immediately after or before high-fiving and so on. If you sample from the private spaces, you get very private information. Like if, if, you, if you would sample from here, you would see like this guy, I don't know, moving the hand or moving the angle because that's specific to the person and to the walking style of each person. And if you sample from here, uh, you get samples different, different styles of the overall motion. So um, I don't have a very good demo for that, but I think you get, you, you get the intuition. And the cool thing is that you learn all this automatically. So when, uh, when uh, Lawrence et al. in 2007, they tried to do this with a stacked um, hierarchical GPLVM, they had to specifically say that they want a shared space here, and they want this space to be two-dimensional, and this space to be private, and one space here. They had to. And, and they had to constrain the noise here. So they had to, to hard code all the structure. So in the Bayesian model, you just give the outputs, and everything is learned automatically. And just to wrap up, um, so uh, while you're, you're seeing this, I'm just going to talk about future work. So one of the downsides of this model is that you know since it's based on GPs, it cannot handle a lot of data. Uh, obviously, but there is uh, a nice idea of extending this with variational stoch stochastic variational inference. And there are two very, very recent papers uh, that we think are applicable to our case. And we think that would be really cool to be able to do deep, deep networks with GPs and also with millions of data. And I think this is the next step. And yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much it. So thanks. Thank you. How big are the weight vectors matrix that you have in that uh, in that one of the product? Yeah, this one. Here. For example, how big is it? F five is. So so here because I had one hundred and fifty points. And because I have worked a lot with these models, I, I know that it's not going to. I mean, you can do some ad hoc experiments yeah. and see that most of them are switched off. So you know, I started with uh, fifteen here, and because I know that you learn more abstract information. I mean, you could just put 20, 20, 20, 20, and so on. They're going to, switch, to be switched off anyway. Okay. Uh, just if, don't. If you, if you get a very much more complex you know, image, do you, how big do you uh, think it might go? I, I don't think so, because for, 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 for the video with the, the, the woman talking, which is like very complex, yes, okay. it's like all the pixels, uh, it, 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 it has only, it, it switches off all dimensions but 12. And this is because, as I said, maybe this, this image of the woman talking, which is uh, one million dimensions, maybe the real dimensionality is, I don't know, 1,000. But the point is, the data that you have, can they support 1,000 dimensions? No, because you have only 100 data. So pretty much from the amount of data, I mean, I have, I have never seen any model using more than 20, to be honest. So if you want to know in practice, I just use 20. Um, and that's because the GPS are limited to, uh, I don't know, a few thousands data points at most. Yeah. 
And usually the data cannot support a lot of dimensions. So another question I'd like to have is that here you talk about regression more so. So do you, do you ever explore uh, discrimination? Has GPP used discrimination? I think I have seen some paper on there. Yeah, so you mean classification, for example? So, so, so here it was totally unsupervised. And one test we did, and thanks for reminding me to say that, is that we took the latent spaces here, and we did a nearest neighbor. So for each latent point here, we found its nearest neighbor and you try to see the errors. So if you take a six and all its nearest neighbor are sixes, then you have zero errors. Uh, and what we saw is that the deepest model had the best error. So we had only one error here. So the best separation uh, comes from a model that, um, that, 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 has the, that, that is the deepest. I actually had this in the demo, but you know, I don't have a lot of time. Using general T model for discrimination is that you just compute the likelihood for each class. Right. So you fix the class. Um, you, and then okay, go, you can, you can class, 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 class conditional. So unfortunately, this um, so this is possible for for the model, and we have actually done that. Um, we have done that with other demos. Uh, if you, if you see the Bayesian GPLVM, for example, you will see this class conditional classification. Uh, but for the deep model, we have it's possible. It's the same, but we haven't implemented that yet. So here's the, the, near, the, the separation of the digits uh, with the deepest hierarchy. You see it's pretty good. So you have all the sixes here, all the zeros. Here you have a six that looks a bit like zero, uh, li like one, so it's here. So you have, you have good separation. So we can't quantify it like this. And I also did proper GP regression where you all actually give the inputs and you get outputs. And I didn't show that here, but we we'll have a paper in submission and it's going to be there. What do you think if you want to run that for MNIST? You know, what kind of rate, error rate do you think you might get? Uh, you cannot run it for the whole MNIST. No? Oh! Uh, because you use GPs, they scare, they, they I, you cannot, I, I don't think, I think you cannot even use GPs for the MNIST, right? I think MNIST is huge. I don't know, how, how big is it? 60,000. Has anyone used GPs, just GPs, not even yeah, the GPs for that? I, I think you can do GPs on MNIST. 60,000 only, right? 60. Um, I mean, GPs are scaled by n, n cubed, right? So it's going to be 60,000 to the power of 3. Well, this is similar to kernel, yeah. kernel regression. Yeah. 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 So it's runnable. I run a lot. You know, but, you have to, but you have to invert 60,000 by 60,000. Is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It takes. It takes. No, no, no. I mean, my computer is probably. I mean, I can easily do six people. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I do inverse. Yeah, but you have to do a lot of inverses because it's non-convex. So you have to do I don't know a thousand inverses. That's fine. I mean, let it run for the night or even for two, three days. Yeah. Anyway, I haven't tried for for the GPS. It would be even slower. So, 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 little comment over here is that, I mean, if you compare with the DBN. Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, TV is very good for generation, but for discrimination, mm -hmm. TV is very bad. So yeah, to, so using the kind of things I, I told you to do. Uh, so this is very now, recent the work. The that 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 TBN is useful for discrimination yeah. is that you just you know take whatever you have and put it in neural network and yeah. it really well. So I wonder whether this one has ever been used. Wait, do, do, do you still do? Uh, so do you fix the DBN or do you do uh, the same DBN. really propagation on the no. on the deep structure? No, no, no. Uh, it's just uh, layer by layer stacking. So you do the stacking, yeah. now fix it, yes. and, and, then, and then initialize and then, it, and then, and then just build network. something on top of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So this is But but you don't do propagation on the. No, no, no. 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 You don't need to do that. Yeah, it's just. Yeah, it's interesting. Like yeah. they yeah. actually yeah. use DBN as a feature extraction. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. And yeah. I just no, but I thought for some places that I read that, that they said that they still do uh -huh. at the end some uh, um, uh, propagation on the entire. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, people do that, but that's not really important. It's not important. It's very important. Yeah, yeah. So pretty much what you did, you know, step by step, that's yeah. enough. But the key is that and at the end, stack some some discriminative model at the top. No, no, not even the top. You just port whatever way you learn, just like your W here, mm -hmm. to some different neural network machine, and use that to initialize, you know, the machine into the results yeah. breaking, mm -hmm. and then everybody's doing that. Yeah. So yeah, so it's a trick. Right. If you claim that this is better, maybe you should explore that way. So, to see what so I, I, other machines I don't think. want to claim that this is better actually uh, because I haven't done experiments. It's just that we are very excited about extending that to large data sets. Yeah. So we are working towards this first so that then we can properly compare to DBNs and don't have to let it run for five days or whatever. 
Uh, but you know, in, in more extensive, I mean, this is very, very recent actually, right? Yeah. In more extensive work, we would like to not only compare to DBS, but you know, maybe they are complementary. You know, GPs have sometimes used for pre-training or vice versa. I don't know, maybe they're complementary with DBNs. And that would be interesting to see. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, that's great work. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Yeah.